In this video, we're gonna unit test our Redis storage implementation. And I must say that you don't need to do this, but if you're new to testing or you're new to Redis, then this may be a useful exercise. Following the convention that we've used before, I'm gonna have a storage directory under my tests directory. And inside that, I'm gonna have the redis.test.ts file. Now there's nothing in this file at this stage, but I'm gonna set the test running and filter the tests down to just run this particular test file. Once I've got my test file created, I'll jump back to the IDE and start setting up some describe blocks. So typically I would have one top level describe block, which describes the particular path to the file under test. And then inside that, I would have another describe block for each of the different functions that exist in this particular module. So in this case, I'm gonna have get, add and remove. I'm gonna put an X before the describe for add and remove as I don't want to run these tests at the moment. You can use X it or X describe to basically skip those tests at the moment. Pretty handy during development. It should be fairly obvious at this point that we're not really practicing test driven development here. It's more is the prototype working driven tests. My first get test will check that if given a new list name, we should get back an empty list. So in order to assert that this is actually the case, I'm gonna import my Redis storage module and then call the get function with a new list name. The intuitive behavior here would be that we get back an empty list, which we do, but in order to get access to that list, we first have to resolve the promise that's returned. This is certainly initially confusing. I remember the first time that I was dealing with promises in tests and Jest was telling me that I had this seemingly empty object once you know why this is happening, however, the solution is really straightforward. We can either use the resolve syntax or my preferred method would be to make this function async and then use await. The reason being that I would be more comfortable with this syntax in my real implementation. So it just makes the tests feel more like the real code. With this initial get test done and working, I'm gonna move on here in a somewhat peculiar order. So. With the initial get test done, I'm confident that we can get stuff back out of Redis at this point. So I'm gonna move on from here in a somewhat peculiar order. In order to test that I can get stuff out of my list when there's stuff in it, I need to be able to add stuff to my list. So whilst I'm gonna initially create a test that allows me to check the contents of a list when there's items in there, I'm gonna move ahead somewhat and focus on adding an item to the list and then come back to that test. Now you'll notice that I'm moving around the constant that contains the list name, and this has some implications. So I'm putting it in the scope that's available to all the different describe blocks. But if you think about it in a different way, whilst this is going to be available to all our tests, under the hood, Redis is going to be reusing this list per test. So what this means is each of the tests is going to rely on the previous test, and that is not good. By which I mean, if you were to move around the get tests so that you first check that there is something in the list and then the second test tests that there is an empty list, well, that second test is going to fail because the first test is gonna have added something to the list, but there's been no cleanup step to remove it in between tests. This then raises a bunch of questions as to how you would effectively test this. My personal approach would probably be towards integration testing so testing this sort of a layer above a unit test, but it's really hard to say generically how to test this, or indeed if you even should. I guess that's why testing is quite a difficult subject beyond just learning the syntax. So as we're about to see in my haste when writing these tests, I've got the assertion wrong on the add function. Intuitively, I would expect to get back the list when I add an item to it. So I would expect to get back the full item contents. But on my interface, that's not how I've defined this at all. What I've done instead is just to return a Boolean if it's been added. So true if it's added and false if it hasn't been added. Or to be more accurate, a promise that when resolved will result in a Boolean. And the same for remove. When I remove an item, I would expect to get back true if it was removed or false if it wasn't. Now, aside from being humbled by my own inadequacies when writing my tests, what I could have done here to improve this implementation is to add return types to my interface. And I should definitely have done this in hindsight. At this point, things start to get messy. So as I mentioned a little earlier, we've got this interdependency going on between our tests, which is to say, if we add something to a list in one test, then it's going to appear in the list in other tests. And this is a problem, not just in terms of one test run, but in terms of the next test run. So we know that Jest runs automatically in the background whenever a file changes. 
And whilst we're making changes here, things are getting added to the list and then the tests rerun and then this causes earlier tests to fail, which makes our tests really brittle. So one very naive solution to this problem is simply to use a different list in each of the different tests. This is only going to push the problem further down the line, but for now it will get us back into a somewhat passing state. And I say a somewhat passing state because as soon as we rerun the tests, we're going to add another item to the list and then that test is going to start failing again. So whilst we've proved that the add function works, we've probably really only solved to frustrate ourselves at this point. Now one solution to this is to use the remove function to clean up after ourselves. I'm not really a big fan of this approach because we have to use our implementation to clean up after ourselves and it just feels so cyclical and so prone to error. It's like catch 22, we need functionality from this function to be able to test the functionality of the wider function or the module as such. It's not nice. For the moment, let's move ahead and create the remove tests. So the implementation is already there and it should behave somewhat similarly to the add test. I'm going to use a couple of variables here as we're going to reuse these names when checking items in the list. But essentially the expectation and the assertion as such is pretty much identical to what we've already seen. You'll have to forgive my mistake here. I've set the expectation on line 63 that we're going to add another item to the list and an item that's already in the list, the name one variable, and then check in that the contents of the list should be just name two. So what I should have done here is use the remove method, of course, but it does give us the opportunity to explore some more of Redis. I must admit that when recording this video, I confused the heck out of myself at this point as to why that item had appeared in the list. I really wasn't expecting it. So my solution to this was to decide to just delete everything that's inside Redis and rerun the tests. I don't know why I didn't look at it in more detail, but there we go. So one of the nice things about Docker Compose is that we've named our service as Redis, which means we don't need to worry too much about the actual container ID. We can connect to our container using Docker Compose exec against the Redis container, and we want to run bin shell. In doing so, we get access to the shell inside that container. From there, we can run the Redis CLI because Redis is installed on this container and so is the uh, CLI. And once inside there, if we run keys with the asterisk, we can see all the different keys that are available inside this particular Redis instance. This highlights the problem in our test that we're not cleaning up after ourselves. But it also means that we can run the flush all command, which as the name might imply, flushes or clears everything that's stored inside Redis. Now this isn't something that you would want to do on a production instance or anything like that, but in the development environment, it's a nice thing to be able to do. As if I hadn't been confused enough whilst recording a single video, what happened to me next, I'm leaving in because I feel like it illustrates why some of this stuff is just not a good idea really by which I mean relying on an external service like Redis as part of your tests and particularly not cleaning up after yourself. But even if you try and clean up after yourself and you try and be a good citizen in that regard, sometimes things just come back and bite you and that certainly happened here. So even though I'd looked inside Redis and I'd flushed the keys and I thought I was starting off from a good point, I quickly got myself back into a bad situation and the outcome of the test just didn't really help me in any way. So what's happening here is really subtle. In this test, I'm saying add the name Chris and then add the name Paul to the list and then check that the list contains those items. So far, so good. I won't want to remove Chris from the list, which should, in theory, leave me with just Paul in the list. And it does, and then the test ends, but we don't clean up after ourselves. So Paul remains in the list and then we rerun the test. And the second time through, we add Chris and Paul to the list, but the list is now Chris and Paul and Paul. And so then we check the list and we see that we have the names Chris and Paul in the list, but we also have the extra Paul. So we've got this extra name. Even though then we remove the name Chris from the list, we've still got two Pauls. To confuse things further, on the second test run, the assertion fails at line 58, rather than where I might have expected it, which was around line 68. If you're finding this description confusing, I hope that gives you some indication as to where my head was after this one. The upshot of this is essentially just make sure that you clean up after yourself, but even if you do, sometimes things just don't go quite to plan. With that debacle out of the way, hopefully you can see why at the start of this, I suggested that this video would be entirely optional 
I sincerely question the validity of testing things like this in this particular way. One thing that's come out of this exercise is that I've realized that I don't really need to test all the items in the list using get at the start there. Again, this comes back to the sort of cyclical nature of these tests. I am testing the get functionality of the list, but I'm testing it elsewhere inside this test. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one. I appreciate it's been a bit of a brain bender video. I was honestly in two minds as to whether to go back and re-record this entire video and make it really like sort of streamlined and look as though I get all this stuff right the first time. When in reality, this is way more like what happens to me in real life. And I've, I do personally think there's a lot of value in seeing this. And with that in mind, I do hope that you have found this useful.